Howdy, soldiers. The sun is out, which means hot barbecue dad is in. I'm feeling good today. I just had this nice little rice protein bowl and I had some coffee and the sun is now showing itself for the first time in months so I can physically feel my seasonal depression leaving my body. And I somehow managed to read nine books in the month of March. Hell, I read three books in a week for the Trans Rights Readathon, so you bet those are gonna be in here too. We did some folk horror, we did some fantastic romanticy, and I read one of the worst traditionally published books I have ever read in my entire life. So if you're ready to join me for my thoughts and opinions, without further ado, grab a drink, grab a snack, and buckle in as we go over the nine books I managed to read in the month of March. First up is a gothic fantasy that at least my side of book talk will not shut the fuck up about. So finally, I bought and read One Dark Window by Rachel Gillig. Every time I heard someone talk about this book, it sounded like they were talking about a different book. And so finally, I just unleashed my inner curiosity demon and now we've read it. And this kind of boils down to mist, bad. Cards, magic. Elspeth, nightmare. So the kingdom of Blunder has been under this curse for a couple hundred years where the entire kingdom is surrounded by this magical mist and if you go into it, you'll go mad and die. And the magic that cursed them is also the magic that they use in the form of a deck of cards and each different type of card holds a different kind of magic and allows the user to do a different kind of thing. And our main character Elspeth is drawn into this web of deception and lies as she finds that the prince is actually a traitor planning a coup. But what they don't know about Elspeth is that she has this kind of demon spirit trapped in her head that allows her to sense magic. To get my main criticism out of the way, the first hundred pages were info dump central because there is so much to the card magic and the backstory of their world that it it felt like reading a textbook. That being said, once that was out of the way, it's so easy to get sucked into this world of espionage. Immaculate atmosphere. And this magic system with the cards, it's like not quite tarot, but it's so unique. And I love how the different cards play into politics. I really like our side characters. Elm is very compelling. And I really love Ellery. He is so conniving yet sympathetic. And the slow burn romance, was so good. I love that we don't start off as enemies to lovers. It's more like antagonists to lovers. But at the same time, Rachel Gillig, girly, you gotta give me something. Like, oh man, halfway through this book, it was just like, oh, just kiss already. And I loved the ending. It was heart pounding and sinister and surprisingly gory. Like, okay, book talk, okay. Like, okay. You have led me egregiously astray on some things, but not on this one. I what just fell? Oh, that's um, vaguely concerning <laughs> that this came out of this book. Don't worry, I went to the Arcana Spirit Lounge where they give you these cards along with your cocktails. Highly recommend, by the way, it's an occult bar. And yes, I brought this book to an occult bar. And yes, I've gone to an occult bar. All right, so time to depress things up a little bit. Have you ever read a book that absolutely wrecked you for the next couple of days after reading it? Uh, yeah, that happened to me this month with My Throat and Open Grave by Tori Bovolino. Hi, I'm here for the cult stuff. I'm actually a little upset about this because this book, its whole campaign, I feel is a little false advertising. This pitches itself as this dark and romantic tale that's kind of labyrinth-esque about a fairy king in the woods taking away a girl's younger brother and then her having to go and get him back. It's barely fae or fantasy. It's kind of like a lightly magical realism contemporary. Like, I showed up here for a spooky forest and and all I got was depression. Leah grew up in a small, religiously conservative Appalachian town and her whole life she's just tried to be the good girl that her church and her community wants her to be. But one night when her baby brother won't stop crying and she's exhausted, she wishes him away and the Lord of the Wood comes to take what has been offered to him. And so then she, with the backing of her community, is like forced to go into the forest to try and get him back. And once she's there, she finds out that she's in the middle of this dark bargain that has to do with other people who have been taken before and like her true self and identity. I'm really impressed with the depth of this book. It is 90% religious trauma and then like a single espresso shot of folk horror. Leah is struggling with this religious upbringing so her internal monologue is very depressed and at times suicidal as she thinks about what it means to be a good person. Purity culture and the guilt and the shame that are pressed on girls. Tori Bovolino nails this slow creeping sense of dread that just gets more and more horrifying with all these small reveals and by the end of this, I was sobbing. Like I cried on public transit. I was 
devastated by this. The visceral feelings that this brought up. But ever since I finished it, I have not been able to stop thinking about it. So I think this is a book that's gonna stick with me for a very long time. And then the next three books are ones that I finished for the Transverse Readathon, which this year ran from March 22nd to March 29th. So let's get into it. I read three new to me authors, with this first one also being a book talk darling, at least in my circles. And I've been waffling about getting it for a little while, but this readathon gave me the teeniest, the tiniest, the smidgenest, the crumble of an excuse to go and buy it. So I did. And that is the romantic, dark academia semi-gothic that is Modern Divination by Isabel Agajanian. 23-year-old Aurelia Schwartz gains top marks at Cambridge by day, but by night struggles to hide her failing green magic. But when another young witch is killed at an academic event and it looks like a power-hungry witch is out on the hunt, she and her rival Theodore Ingram escape to a small seaside town where his family has a hidden cottage, and the two of them are trying to solve this mystery while also maybe falling a little in love. This book is Earl Grey tea and crow's wings and getting trapped in open fields and rainstorms. The writing is beautiful. They really take the time to set the scene and just little tweaks in atmosphere that make you feel like you are engulfed in this book. And like the writing, it always goes somewhere that you're not quite expecting. So you're kind of like caught off guard at the end of every sentence in a way that keeps you really engaged and wanting more. They're so good at writing subtle tension. And particularly, there is so much tension between Aurella and Teddy. Oh my God. First of all, Aurelia is so smart and so stubborn, a bit bitter, but like, thank God she is because she's the one that is asking the right questions. And like, thank God, finally someone is. And Teddy Ingram is the kind of man that I can't help but love. He's tall, he's gangly, he's an academic. He sometimes turns into a crow monster. He's broody, he's delicate, and I would do anything for him. I can't help it. I just, I love a pathetic man. The themes in this book are something that I think a lot of people could relate to. Not letting yourself get in the way of yourself and letting go of grudges, not always assuming the worst of other people. And then even more into like, self-loathing and depression and alcohol reliance. This reminded me a lot of A Study in Drowning, so if you read that, you might like this as well. Second book I read for the readathon is the one that I liked the least, unfortunately, and that is Prince of the Sorrows by Kellen Graves. And I'm so disappointed because I wanted this to be everything, and unfortunately, it was not. This was pitched to me as like fantasy romance cruel prince but gay. And I was like, that is checking all my boxes, that is floating my boat, that is putting fruit in my fruit bowl, I don't know. There's a lot of really cool ideas that just weren't done to my liking. Our main character, Saffron, is a changeling baby who's been living in the world of the Fae, and he's kind of like a servant to this big fairy academy, and he f ends up accidentally bumping into and getting the true name of one of the princes of the Unseelie court. So the two of them strike a bargain that the prince will help him get his academic scholarship, and Saffron is trying to find a way to break the guise that allows him to remember the prince's true name, and then, oh my gosh, there's somebody killing Fey people at the school, the two of them are have to kind of make an alliance and then like, oh my god, we're gonna fall in love. Now the things I liked about this, I liked a lot. I really love the naming conventions of the changelings. I like the relationship that Saffron has with the pixies and the Undine. There's some really cool ring magic, like wearable magic, and a bunch of gender fuckery, which is always a treat. And though I like the idea of the Fey being cruel because this is mostly a like Gallic and Welsh type of fairy, they're just so mean to Saffron. And I didn't love the character development. I know we're doing an enemies to lovers type of thing, but like Sylvan, he's just too back and forth, cruel and nice, without a solid foundation of empathy to kind of show him working through his prejudices or his misinterpretations for, like, for me to really feel attached to him. And then Saffron is just like so painfully naive. And even though I like the second half way more than I like the first half, I was getting this emotional whiplash between the characters as they both jumped ahead and then like regressed in their character development without a good reason other than like the plot needed them to. So I felt like a lot of stuff was wrapped up in here that just needed to be wrapped up to like make the story happen. But like, I felt like there was so much opportunity to just like leave it open and then like write something else into the sequel. So if it's for you, it's for you. But unfortunately, these queer fairy boys are not going to be resting on my fae magic shelf. And lastly, thirdly, is a book that I got sent from Renko's Books and Tortine. And this is the uh, queer poly 
uh, uh, POC filled young adult fantasy debut from Case and Calendar, which is Infinity Alchemist. Oh, that was a struggle. In this historical fantasy, alchemy is outlawed unless you have a license and all magic is highly regulated. Ashwoods hopes to study alchemy at the prestigious Lancaster College, but can't get in. So he takes a job as groundskeeper to the college and practices magic in secret. But one day he's caught by the alchemical progeny that is Ramsey Thorne, who instead of turning him in, decides to take him on and the two of them are now searching for this lost book of source that is like this magical text that no one really believes in but Ramsey says that it's real but of course the mission is more dangerous than we imagined and we're meeting new people and uncovering conspiracies and uh, having feelings about it. This is probably the first multiverse academia that I've ever read. This straddles such an interesting line of using religious allegories to describe kind of harnessing the energy of the universe, but then it also goes into the science of this magic. A very compelling trans mask main character, incredibly smart but frustrating gender fluid love interest. We get some chill gender stuff. We get some very healthy depictions of sexuality and a deeply invested deeply adorable polycule. It goes into the social dynamics of being an outcast, being a minority, and of course, generational trauma, everybody's favorite. That being said, it's very heavy with its themes. Like this basically just beats you over the head with its themes and like, I, it's a YA novel that's dealing with a lot of heavy topics. So like, I guess I'll let it slide. This book is so fast paced that I feel like I've read an entire trilogy in one book. And I don't know if that's good or not, but I mean, like, at least I'm getting my money's worth. Although I was sent this, so I didn't pay anything. Plot points would be brought up and then we'd be done them in like a, two chapters and then we'd be moving on. And like the first 17 chapters of this book could have been one whole book. Like, I really wish that we had explored and deepened those magic system ties and the relationships a little bit more. So I guess if you don't have time to read an entire trilogy, but you still want a story with a very specific three-act structure, then I guess this book is for you. All right. It's time to rant. So usually if I read a book that I don't like, I tend to give it at least like two stars on Goodreads or whatever, because I feel bad. Cause I'm like the author like wrote a book, you know, there like were characters in it that did some stuff. So I'll give them kind of the benefit of the doubt. This book, however, one star. Truly one of the worst books that I have ever read. I truly need to scream about Sanctuary of the Shadow by Aurora Asher. If you like this book, Look away now because I am about to eviscerate this on the internet. A Red Tower, AKA the same imprint that is Fourth Wing. This is their new romance fantasy that is about a magical circus. And there's this girl named Harrow who has powers and she's in this circus, but then the circus gets this like new weird type of creature and he's so hot. And then the two of them like form an alliance and run away from the circus together. And then like, you know, the plot line happens. And I love magic circuses. And I like at the beginning we're introduced to this kind of like card tarot magic with water. And then eventually they go to this city that like the streets disappear so like maps don't work there like that is so cool but the writing is horrendous how in the world did this get traditionally published there is so much telling it is info dump central like where is the mayor of info dump city oh here she is there are so many plot holes that come up even within the first three chapters, like have none of you asked a question in your entire life? Everything is over explained. There's so many filler lines. So much of the character doing anything is because she just knew she should. Okay, but why? And the love story is so creepy because it starts off with this eth ethereal being being trapped in a mortal form. And he has no memory of who he was or who he is or his name. He can't even speak. When they first meet, she compares him to a child. She reads his mind and is like, oh, he's so childish like he doesn't even know how like what the things are but oh my god he's like so sexy like do I have to explain why that's weird and the fact that he has no memory and the attitude of a child makes the sex scenes that begin like right away even worse like what what even was that sex scene and it's so repetitive it just keeps telling you the same thing over and over again so that the reader we understand what's happening like 15 chapters before our main character does. And when she finally realizes stuff, she is literally dragged to that understanding, kicking and screaming. Like she, 
Uh, how are you alive, truly? I hate this book. I have read better written, sponsored Instagram posts. Our main character does not have two brain cells to rub together, and the whole love story is super creepy. Uh, it, then the whole plot line is just so convoluted, and no one makes any changes, and no one makes things that make any sense. <sighs> getting rid of this. Oh my god, I'm sweating. Well, now that I've just spent the last 20 minutes yelling about a romantic book that I hated, I think now it's only fair that I get to spend the next 20 minutes yelling about a romantic book that I loved. I was beyond excited. Nay, I was bed, bath, and beyond ecstatic when Danielle L. Jensen released her latest romantic of Fate Inked in Blood, and I'm jazzed to be able to say that I absolutely adored this. This was also featured in one of my last videos where I talked about heavy fantasy romantic books, and like, Danielle L. Jensen is the freaking queen. From the author of the phenomenal Bridge Kingdom series, we get a new fantasy romance that centers Norse mythology and god powers. Our main character, Freya, is a shield maiden, a woman with the ability to channel the power of a god, and when a band leader finds out about this power, he forcibly takes her to conscript her into his own army to eventually take over Skaland. And when she's there, she meets his son, along with a other band of heroes who all have the ability to channel the power of a god, and she struggles being a pawn in this new political scheme, along with maybe falling in love and finding out new things about her own power. It's a fast but consistent pace, there's some great battle sequences and this brutal and bloody winter. Loved watching Freya's internal struggles, she is full of rage and I respect that. We got some nuanced antagonists that are just, ooh, mwah, chef's kiss. Also, our main character acquires a disability quite early on, she gets her whole arm burned, and then throughout the book has multiple grievous injuries that always affect her. So I love the fact that we get disability rep, but we also get a realistic look into what it's like being a fighter. And then we get stuff like religious fanaticism and the mental toll of war and mommy issues. Some great flirty banter, and I love how especially at the beginning B Freya is calling Bjorn out on his bullshit. And of course the steamy scenes where very steamy. If Danielle L. Jensen knows how to write two things really well, it is fighting and other word that begins with F. By the end of it, you're just getting punched in the face with plot twists. And I was like screeching and flailing around and like knocking pillows off my bed because of course I was reading this until like one in the morning. I really, really loved it. I will continue to be reading the saga of the unfaded and any other books that Danielle L. Jensen puts out, obviously. So if you also maybe like this, you can check out that video that I did, just saying. Cross promotion. Second to last is a book that I promised myself that I would read last month because for whatever reason, February was a month of fairies and vampires. And this vampire novel was on my TBR, but I didn't quite get around to it. And so it's fine. Vampires are all year round. Just like Halloween is all year round. Spooky season cannot be contained to a single month. So I finally picked up The Vampires of El Norte by Isabel Canyas, mostly because my girlfriend just finished reading it and she said that Nestor was one of the top 10 male leads that she's ever read, and she's a lesbian. So I knew it was gonna be good. In this beautiful historical fiction book, we get vampires and long lost loves and colonialism. This supernatural Western kicks off in 1846 Mexico when the United States invades and two long lost childhood friends are brought together now that the war has happened, but also something sinister lurks behind the gun smoke and it's not white people and well I'm, it's i mean it's always white people but like not only not this t Nena is the daughter of a rancher struggling to prove her worth to her family as more than just something to marry off and even though she was attacked by an animal nine years ago she is now a healer who is working for the army whereas Nestor is a vaqueros for hire and he comes back to the ranchero that he spent his childhood at and it turns out that he thought Nena was dead but she's not and the two of them are trying to reconcile with this broken history along with her family's disapprovement disapprovement disapproval is this a permanent word? Disapprovement is a word. English degree coming in clutch. And these vampires are weird and I love them. They're unlike any other vampire that I've read. First of all, they're gray skinned and elongated. Also, they have no eyes. Don't like that, but also I love it. They're like if bats were wolves, but then also they're like still kind of human. Maybe. I had a little bit of trouble with Nena as our main character. Her motivations were strong, but her actions were a little hard to follow, especially when Nestor, like, comes back and I'm like, bitch, your boyfriend's back from the dead, like, shouldn't you be a little bit more excited? And their relationship in general had tension, but there's some kind of some ups and downs and the tension of it all. But my girlfriend was not wrong about Nestor. Oh my goodness. 
That boy is so in love. He has been gone for nine years and he has never stopped thinking of Nena. And then eventually when they get together, he's basically like, here's my heart on a platter. I love you. You're my sun, my moon, my stars. Like I will never, ever, I will wait as long as you need me to. Like I will be in your life some way or another because I do not know how to stop loving you. Like. Nestor is the final boss wife guy. <laughs> and though I did love the twist on the ending and kind of realizing some of the allegory of it all, I did feel like it was a bit bittersweet. I kind of wish we got a little bit more wrap up or at least a little bit more of a hint of like what's gonna happen in the future because it's left very ambiguous. But I'm out here just like Nana, choosing my own fate. And hey, I'm glad this book was in fate's tangle, was in, was in fate's books for me was in fate's schedule for me. I'm glad they scheduled this in on my, you know, fate calendar, my fate Google Doc. And lastly is the book that holds two distinctions. A, being a final of a series, so it's a sequel that I've made myself read, and two, being the book that made me cry the most this month. Ooh, actually that might be a draw between this book and My Throat and Open Grave. But regardless, I was screeching, I was laughing, I was sobbing. I was finishing Defend the Day by Bridget Kever, the third of the Defy the Night trilogy. This is one of the best YA trilogies I've ever read. The amount of nuance and discussion that Bridget Kever manages to put in these books is a little outrageous, actually. A fantasy Robin Hood retelling between Tessa and West, who are two outlaws who are trying to get a medicine to distribute to the masses who are all under this type of plague. And then we find out the conspiracies about the crown. And then we also follow the two princes who have risen to power too fast after their parents were assassinated and they don't know who to turn to and who to choose. It's got plagues, it's got politics, it's got people unraveling their privilege, people struggling with their identity, the bonds of friendship, rebellion, brotherhood. Her male characters in particular are so good. I love Korok, but I absolutely love Harristan. I will Harristan him until literally the end of days. This book, just like the others, has great comedic timing as well that kind of lighten and break up that dark, twisty political drama. And I'm all for imaginative fantasy worlds, particularly those that look into science and like medicine. I think that was a really cool take on this series with Tessa being an apothecary and then this whole plague and like antidotes and stuff. But uh, goddamn, 90% of their problems would be solved if just one of them had a goddamn cell phone. And then we get the aftermath and consequences of winning a war. Like, I cried all of my skincare off. Bridget Kemmerer knows how to wrap up a series. I continue to be impressed by all these characters and the nuances that they bring. So I would highly, highly recommend this series. If nothing else, just prepare yourself for some devastation. And there's gonna be a lot. And with that, that is that on that. Oh boy, I need a tea. Those are the nine books that I managed to finish in the month of March. If you have read any of these, please let me know, or please let me know what you read for the Trans Rights Readathon. I already do not know if I have room for all of these. Uh, so I know I've been like, I'm gonna do a bookshelf remodel for the last like four months, um, and I haven't yet, so maybe in April it'll happen. <laughs> I need to make myself a romanticy shelf. I need to make myself a gothic shelf. And damn, do I need to dust these things. I need to organize it. I need to dust it. I need to take it down, flip it and reverse it. The sun's still out. I've stayed hydrated this entire video. And I have a couple of hours before I have to get ready to go to dance class. So like, my God, what am I gonna do with myself? Maybe I'll go take a walk. Maybe I'll like, go outside and have like a nice little hot girl walk or something. Like I put sunscreen on this morning, I'm good to go. You know where to click to like the video. You know where to click to subscribe. I hope you guys are all having a nice day wherever you are and I will see you all next week. Bye.